So welcome folks. This is Archaeology Cafe number six of our 14th season of doing these Archaeology Cafes this year, uh, full, full season online. It's been a real opportunity to share uh, and highlight the diverse ways that uh, our Archaeology Southwest staff and their collaborators uh, pursue our, our, our uh, preservation archaeology mission. And we're finding that uh, actually people are learning new things about things that we do here at Archaeology Southwest. So uh, again, welcome back if you're a <clears throat> return, returnee. Um, and welcome uh, if this is your first night to join us. So Archaeology Southwest is located in downtown Tucson. Uh, Tucson's the traditional uh, territory of the Tana Autumn Nation. And wherever you are uh, joining us tonight from, please think about and uh, think about uh, the gratitude that you should feel for um, being on the traditional territory of indigenous peoples, uh, again, wherever you are. There's a couple of logistics. Um, the uh, really important uh, folks that we want to thank and honor are the Smith Living Trust, uh, that they're supporting this uh, year's cafes. And uh, thank you, uh, Smith family, uh, for your generosity. So let's get to our speakers. Uh, I'll be pretty short and brief here. Um, Karen Schollmeyer uh, earned her PhD from Arizona State University and is now a a preservation archaeologist here at Archaeology Southwest. Scott Ingram, same sentence, earned his degree, <laughs> PhD at Arizona State University, and now though is a uh, assistant pr professor at Colorado College up in, in uh, Colorado. Denver uh, is where he's located. Um, so I do want to point out that Archaeology Southwest is very ecumenical. Um, we don't play favorites between Arizona State University and uh, University of Arizona. We find that having uh, friends, colleagues, and employees uh, from both places is the best way to exist in this state of Arizona. And it's uh, worked really well for us. So um, let's get to tonight's presentation. Climate change is a, is a pretty um, current topic. Um, and its global impacts are a regular area of uh, topic of discussion. And, but tonight, our speakers are going to take us back uh, a good distance in uh, time and explore climate issues that uh, Indigenous residents of the Southwest experienced in the past and how they addressed some of the uh, threats and uh, challenges and, and uh, made decisions. So the topic, should we stay or should we go? Farming and climate change, 1000 to 1450 uh, before the common era. Karen and Scott, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And Linda and I will fade away and let you take it off. Hi, thanks everyone for being here tonight. And uh, we are indeed talking about time, climate change and how people respond to climate events. And we're talking a lot about uncertainty and climate change. Uh, and that's something that really resonates with a lot of us right now, I think, because um, we're going to be talking about uncertain times and how people respond in uncertain times. And we're kind of living in uncertain times. Uh, in terms of climate, we just had these horrible storms in a lot of the country where people got hit by a lot of snow and ice that they're not used to and that they didn't necessarily have the infrastructure to handle and that had pretty disastrous consequences. Meanwhile, it hasn't frozen in my backyard in Tucson all year. My basil plants are still alive and that's not normal either. And that's also got a lot of consequences for plants and animals and people where I live. And we're also obviously living in an extra uncertain time because of COVID. And that's affected all of us in a lot of different ways. A lot of things that most of us probably took for granted thought we could count on, we've realized are actually pretty uncertain things. Uh, a year ago, it never occurred to me that my kids might not go to school every day uh, and that I wouldn't go to work um, and that we'd all be doing all of these things from home. Uh, it didn't occur to me that I might go to the store and there wouldn't be any paper products. 
Uh, a lot of the stuff that I took for granted has turned out um, to be things that I shouldn't take for granted and things that are pretty uncertain. And when you're going through a lot of changes, it's hard. It's hard to adjust. Everybody has different challenges, but uh, it's hard for every, everybody to adjust to these things. And the changes that we're talking about today that occurred centuries ago were also changes that were hard for people who lived through them. People did live through them. The descendants of the people that we're talking about are still living in the Southwest successfully, but for the people who had to live through these events, uh, it was a hard time. So it's sort of encouraging in the big picture, I think, but uh, it was very hard for these people to live through some of these things that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, but that means that when we're looking at uncertain times and how people respond and what people do, uh, we can look at a really long time scale and see how the choices that people made worked out. So we have this really interesting record, sometimes kind of an amazing record of how people responded to different things in the past, the decisions that they made, uh, how it worked out, and uh, what happened in the, in the very long term that can help us think about some of these questions and challenges that we're facing right now. So how this research came about uh, and how people respond to climate change, how people respond to events like droughts, and how people react when they're faced with all of this uncertainty uh, has its roots when Scott and I had both recently finished graduate school. Bill was talking about how we both went to ASU. Uh, we actually had the same advisor and we were invited to give a talk on how archaeology could contribute to climate change issues. And we had both been doing independent research in different parts of the Southwest uh, on different topics, but we were both really interested in how people responded to droughts and what happened when there were droughts in the Southwest. And uh, we both had certain expectations about what we'd find. We thought that people who had certain advantages would do better uh, in these times of uncertainty and in times of drought than people who lacked other things. And we both independently working in different places found out that we were extremely wrong. We got results that we really didn't expect at all. So when we gave that talk together, uh, it was kind of surprising to us that we'd both come up with um, such unexpected results. Uh, so since then, we've kind of mulled this over and we recently went back and re-examined that research that we did and uh, that work just came out in an article in Kiva and that's the research that we're going to be talking about today. So we have been thinking about this, it started in our dissertations, but we've been thinking about it for a little while. So we're really looking at um, how do people respond to droughts in these cases in the Southwest and what makes people decide, should I stay or should I go? And what we found out has implications for how we live now. And it also reminds us that um, the answers are often very much not what we expect. So I'm gonna turn it over to Scott to talk about uh, how we figured all of these things out. Thanks, Karen, and welcome everyone. As an overview of our talk, we'll tell you more about the Central Arizona and Membrous peoples during the uncertain times of about 1000 to 1450 CE. We'll focus on the uncertainties we expect farmers face during droughts. Droughts are not uncommon in the Southwest, but they make it difficult for farmers to decide how much to plant and whether they can succeed in getting their crops to maturity. We'll provide some details on the results that surprised us, and we're still working to understand. We'll also tell you about why we think these results are important. For you, we think they're important, and we hope that this talk will help you think about the challenges and opportunities of the warming world we are currently living in, in perhaps a deeper way than you might have before. For archaeologists, we think the results are important because they remind us of how much more we have to learn and how what we learn matters for the present and the future. Toward the end of our talk, we'll have more to say about why and how these results are important for the present and the future. But let's take a look at our first study here in central Arizona. I've always been interested in migration and population decline in the southwest and northwest Mexico during the 1200 to 1500 period. This period is characterized by extensive migration that culminated in up to 50% population loss. The red dots on these maps are settlements of at least 12 rooms. Some could be as many as 1,000. So the maps are not showing you those differences and how many people live in each one of these locations. When the new dots appear as you move from one 50 year map to the next, beginning with the 1200 to 1249 and ending with the 1450 to 1499 map, when the dots vanish, they're moving away from places, people living in, in those places. 
Each map represents a 50 year period beginning in the 1200s. And as I said, ending in the 1400s. And so you can see what I mean by extensive migration and depopulation in the Southwest. These data are recorded in the Coalescent Communities Database, which Archaeology Southwest has always been involved with and is now available on their website. It's important to note that the settlement data captured here is even more extensive when I first produced these maps. It's also important to acknowledge that we expect some people lived in places not recorded on these maps, such as areas in Southern and Western Arizona and elsewhere. Despite the fact that these maps do not capture everywhere people were living, this is the most complete database available of where people lived and when in the Southwest Northwest. What caused the extensive migrations and lowering population levels these maps record? Was it drought? Well, this is more complicated than it seems because droughts are a common occurrence in the Southwest, as well as dry climates worldwide. We can't just point to a drought that happened when some social change or migration occurs and say the drought caused people to do something. For example, Southwest archeologists now know that the migration out of the Mesa Verde region in southwestern Colorado began about 1250, before the so-called Great Drought that began about 1275, indicated by that red bar. Given the frequency of droughts and social changes in the Southwest, one can often find two occurring at the same times and places. But there are lots of droughts where archaeologists don't observe migrations or social changes. This is the well-known problem of confusing correlation with causation. I had to look more deeply, so I focused on the central Arizona area for my study. Instead of looking at just a single drought and what people did during that dry period, I statistically compared the relationship between the number of multi-year droughts in every 50-year period and compared this to the extent of migration that occurred during the 1200 to 1450 period. And I asked, what was the long-term relationship, 250 year long one? What was that relationship between drought and migration in central Arizona? Here I provide a brief summary of my methods so you can understand the results I'll show you. For a full explanation, please take a look at that Kiva article that should be out here early in 2021. First, I need to measure the extent of migration during each 50 year interval to match the annual resolution of the climate data from tree rings. Using the coalescent communities database, I divided the number of rooms abandoned by the number of rooms occupied to get the percent of rooms abandoned. This creates a measure of the extent of migration during each 50 year period. It's important to be clear here that Abandonment in my use does not imply that the indigenous peoples that lived in a settlement gave up their ties to that place. We know this is not the case as ties in many places persist to the present. Next, I needed to identify the extent of drought during each 50 year interval that would allow me to compare the annual resolution of the drought data to the 50 year resolution of the migration index. I did this by calculating the percent of drought years during each 50 year interval. This identifies the extent of dryness during each 50 year period. To, to statistically determine if drought was affecting the extent of migration during the 250 year period of study, I created scatter plots and correlation analyses. What I'm showing you here are not real results. The two scatter plots I'm showing now are just to help you understand the actual results that I'll show you here in just a moment. So bear with me, this will just take a moment, but I wanna make sure everyone can read and interpret these scatter plots well. The scatter plot on the left shows a very strong long-term statistical relationship between the percent of years identified as a drought and the percent of rooms abandoned during each 50 year interval. This relationship is analogous to a thermostat. When you turn the thermostat up, the heat goes up, depending on how much you crank the dial. Very predictable, a little bit, a bit of a crank, the temperature goes up a little bit and so forth. The scatter plot on the right shows no long-term relationship between drought and movement. When you turn the thermostat up, you get all sorts of temperatures, not just ones that go up. There's no evidence that drought is affecting people's decision to migrate in that scatter plot on the right. So these methods and more I won't go into tonight allowed me to ask all sorts of different questions about what might have been affecting people's decisions to stay or go when confronted with dry conditions. I was especially interested in where people were living and how where they lived were affecting these decisions. As we all know, the Southwest is environmentally diverse and of course, many social ways diverse as well. 
I'll share just a few of the questions and their answers tonight that I considered. First, I asked, did people living in areas with the highest average annual rainfall move less than people living in areas with the lowest average rainfall, represented by these two photos? Well, common sense told me that you know, people living in the driest areas would be the most vulnerable to drought. It's hard to grow food in areas with low rainfall, even during good rainfall years. I thought people living in the driest areas would be the most likely to migrate, to move away from these dry conditions somewhere they could do better. So this is a modern rainfall map that you're looking at with drier areas on the lower left hand corner with the pink and red colors where Phoenix is. Precipitation there on an annual basis using modern data is quite low, as you know, maybe eight, nine inches or so a year. As you move north and east up in elevation, people living in those areas receive more precipitation. Those are the yellow, brown, and green colored areas. So with these maps, I was able to figure out the average rainfall amount for each settlement in my study. These are averages, not what people would have experienced during droughts. During droughts, these levels would have incrementally gone down depending on the severity of the drought. So people in dry areas should move more often, right? That's what I thought. Well, that's not what I found. People living in areas with the highest average annual rainfall move more frequently than people living in areas with the lowest precipitation. The scatter plot on the left shows that there's no relationship between drought and migration in areas that received low precipitation. The scatter plots, one in the middle and on the right, shows that the relationship is quite strong. As drought frequency and duration increased, people moved more as drought severity increased. This is that thermostat-like relationship I was describing. A little more increase in drought severity, a little more movement. Decrease in drought severity, a little less movement. People living in areas that receive the highest average annual precipitation move more often than people living in areas with the lowest precipitation. Next, I asked if there were differences in people's decisions to stay or go during dry periods based on what watershed they were living in. I was trying to see if there were any spatial patterns in people's decisions to stay or to go. The answer was yes. Using the same correlation analysis methods I showed you before, I found that people living in the, and that would be the previous slide there, Karen, uh, people living in the lower Verde, the Tonto, and the upper watersheds were the most likely to move when confronted with dry conditions. These are watersheds three, four, and five on the map. People living in other watersheds were less likely to move. What explains these differences? Next slide. To answer this question, I looked at average precipitation levels in each watershed and the amount of stream flow in each watershed and found that people living in the Lower Verde, Upper Salt, and Tonto watersheds had higher average annual precipitation and rivers with higher stream flow levels than people living in the Upper Verde and the Agua Fria. Where people had access to more water, they moved more often during droughts. Again, you see that thermostat-like relationship here. Before I stop, one more result. When I looked at all the settlements in the central Arizona area and where they were located, I found that people living far from perennial rivers, like the area shown on the right, did not move more often during dry conditions. Common sense would lead us to think that people living far from a perennial river where they couldn't irrigate their crops or have regular or predictable access to water, that they would have had a harder time producing their crops and need to move more often. Well, that's not what happened. They moved at about the same rates. So it didn't matter whether they lived in the high precipitation areas, lots of stream flow, or in the low precipitation areas. So it was clear that the amount was not, a, a precipitation stream flow was not significantly affecting them based on whether they lived near or far from a river. Okay, what explains these surprising results? Well, I can't be sure, but it might be because people living in areas with low average rainfall and far from perennial rivers had more strategies to deal with dry conditions and lessen their shortfall risk because they dealt with it more frequently. There are many strategies, trade and exchange with others that have more, extensive storage of your food, being willing to change your diet, growing your crops in different places, and all sorts of water management strategies like these sketches drawn by Roxanne Swinsell to catch and channel water to where crops need it. Perhaps people living in areas where water was more accessible and abundant did not have as many well-developed strategies. 
Many technological and social strategies take time to build and can't just be created as a response to a specific drought. If this was the case, then deciding to move when drought created food shortfalls in wetter areas might have been the most effective solution. Overall, it might be that people's perceptions of drought risks were different in these wetter and drier places. And these perceptions might have affected the strategies they developed and the decisions they made during dry conditions. Karen will have more to say about the role of human perceptions in decisions to stay or go. Let's turn the experience in the members area now. Now we're gonna look at another case of uh, people responding to a drought, this time in Southwest New Mexico in the Membrace area. And uh, I'm, I was really interested in differences in how people responded to the same drought, depending on which area they lived in, a wetter or a drier place. And I think when a lot of us think of the Membrace area, we think of the Membrace Valley, and that's an area with a big broad floodplain and a flowing river, and it gets more rainfall than the Eastern Membrace area where I focused my research, uh, which gets a lot less and it's a drier place. But the way that the drought affected people, the way that people responded was quite different in these two places. And I'm gonna explore a little bit about why I think that happened. The classic Membrace uh, was a time period archeologists uh, label from AD 1000 to 1130. And during this time, people were living in big masonry pueblos aggregations of rooms, each of which was probably something like a house, uh, near their farmland. There were a lot of people and a lot of agriculture. The, in this particular area, this time was um, when the most people were living together who had ever lived together in villages before. So people had to deal with a lot more sorts of issues that you get when you get a lot of people moving into the same place than they had before. And they had to come up with social structures to, to deal with some of that. And one of the things that archaeologists can see that shows very strongly uh, is that everybody uses the same kind of decorated pottery in these villages. And Membrace is really known for this pottery. You can see an example on the slide. They made these really striking black and white decorated pots. And uh, a lot of you have probably seen these in museums and recognize them as Membrace right away. They're very recognizable. Well, it's interesting that people who are living in this, again, relatively high population density period, these were really the only um, painted decorated pots that they used, and they were the only painted decorated pots that they made. People living in other parts of the Southwest all around them decorated their pots differently, but we almost never find them in a classic Membrace village. Instead, people in these villages were just using their own decorated pottery. Uh, and you don't see a whole lot of classic Membrace pottery outside of these villages either, although you see some. So it looks like people are uh, expressing an identity really strongly in this pottery. And it probably has something to do with living together in these bigger groups and needing a sort of glue to stick these bigger groups together, socially speaking. After 1130, a lot of things changed. Uh, in the East, we call this Membrace Reorganization. Uh, for a generation or maybe two, people emptied out of a lot of these big villages that they'd been living in for centuries before. And regionally, the population declined. A lot of people moved out of the Membrace Valley. Remember that wetter place. A lot of people moved out of that valley altogether. Some smaller populations remained, but not many. Uh, and in the east, people responded a little differently. They moved out of their villages, but they didn't actually move out of the river valleys. Uh, they moved to places where they'd had small farmsteads before. Those became little hamlets that housed several families. So they weren't moving away completely, but they did move out of the villages that they'd been living in for quite a long time. And here we can see that they eventually stop using classic membrace black and white pottery, which has that really, really strong social identity signal. And they start to use pottery from other places all around them. That's really so showing that they have social connections to the people who live all around them in other areas. So I was interested in understanding why this changed uh, partly to understand the difference between the East and the Membrace Valley that I talked about that was wetter and partly to understand what sorts of things led people who lived in the Eastern Membrace to change what they were doing. And what I really focused on was how did access to food contribute to these changes? Uh, did access to productive land decrease over time, uh, especially during a drought that was happening uh, right around 1120 when this big change took place? 
And when that drought occurred and people moved in the Eastern River Base out of their villages and into little hamlets in the same general area, were those little hamlets in better places? Did they help people respond to this drought by getting access to better agricultural land that was productive during that drought starting at 1120? So again, you can see that difference, the Membrace Valley being a wetter place that was almost depopulated, a few populations remained there, and the Eastern Membrace, again, uh, that drier place, and we're seeing um, a very different response uh, to the precipitation changes and how the population changes. The Membrace Valley mostly gets depopulated, and the Eastern Membrace doesn't, and people move to smaller places within that area. So why did that happen? Did moving from their villages to the nearby hamlets in the Eastern, the Eastern Membrace area give people better access to farmland doing, during a drought? I'm not going to take you through the minutiae of this, but I spent quite a long time as a graduate student trying to figure out uh, whether the answer was yes or no. I did a GIS analysis of productivity, which basically meant I divided the landscape in the Eastern Membrace into these little tiny cells, and you can see an example of that on your screen. I looked at maize growth requirements for water and nutrients. I looked at reconstructions of annual precipitation, sort of like some of the ones that Scott talked about. I looked at the runoff gathering potential of each of these little cells to see if they're collecting runoff in a different way. I looked at soil permeability. I looked at um, how close productive land areas were to villages and hamlets and at soil fallowing rates and all kinds of different variables, variables because I thought I'd see some kind of really subtle difference here. I thought I, I would see people doing a subtle thing by moving from villages to hamlets uh, that helped them uh, get better access to farmland. So did I find a difference? The answer is no. <laughs> uh, I didn't get a subtle pattern at all. I got a really clear and obvious pattern. Uh, it looks like most of the time people would have had plenty of access to productive farmland if they'd stayed in the classic membrane villages in this area. Um, there was a drought, it did affect people, but it didn't affect people in the sense that there were no productive fields left because it wasn't raining enough to grow anything at all. That's not what happened here. Instead, if, if you look at all of these bars on this graph, the green bars are showing you times when there's plenty of productive land for the population of these villages. There's one yellow bar and that's right when this drought hits in that period from 1121 to 1130. And that yellow bar means that in that 10 years, people at one village would have had to walk one kilometer farther to get to their fields uh, in order to feed everybody um, in the way that they were used to. So that's not a really big difference. Uh, people really reacted in a way that is stronger than what as an archeologist I would have predicted. Uh, it looks from these data as though people could have stuck it out and stayed in the big villages and they didn't need to reorganize into hamlets. Uh, but clearly there was another reason that people did need to do that because that is in fact what they decided to do. We can see that looking at the archeological record. So uh, why did this happen? Why did these people move the way that they did? What contributed to that? So I got a result that I really wasn't expecting. And that's actually a good result in science because if we always find exactly what we expect, we don't really learn anything. So by doing all of these complicated analyses and coming out with a big fat no, it actually made me think a lot more about things that I probably wouldn't have thought of if the answer had turned out to be what I expected. And uh, one of the things that I thought a lot about and that I think is really key to this is the way people perceived what was happening to them. If you read literature about how farmers respond to droughts today, for example, uh, certain things stand out. People are responding to droughts not based on a mathematical model like what I did uh, or other sets of numbers, they're comparing what's happening to them with what's happened in their past experience and what they've heard about the past from their parents and grandparents and other people that they know. So they're responding to drought events uh, based on what their experience and knowledge of drought events is and not based on the sorts of things that I was necessarily measuring as an archeologist. And another really important thing that contributes to how people respond to droughts is their perception of their control over the situation. This affects how people respond to all sorts of things. If we feel like we have more control, we uh, maybe try to stay in place and adjust things. Whereas if we feel like things are totally out of our control, we're likely to make much bigger changes to try and, uh, to try and rectify that. So our perceptions of whether we're failing or succeeding aren't based on math, that's pretty obvious, but 
Uh, they are based on how we're thinking about what's happening to us. And this feeds into what a lot of archeologists, including me, think about the end of membranes now. Uh, if you were to go back and read old textbooks, it sounds like from a generation or two ago, it sounds like um, when classic membranes ended, people stopped making classic membranes black and white pottery. They stopped living in those villages. It sounds like everybody disappeared. Uh, we know that that's not true. As I was explaining earlier, we can see that people, some people are moving around on the landscape farther than others, but their people haven't vanished. They just changed what they're doing. They're changing the things that they make. But changing the things that they make is a really big deal. That's what we see archeologically and it's sending a really strong message. So when I mentioned that these pots were a very strong signal of membrane social identity, it's a very strong signal when you stop making those pots too. When you stop living in those villages that your people have lived in for centuries and you stop making the pots that identify you as a member of that group, uh, you're making a really, really big social change. So probably people are changing what they're doing because they perceive that it's not working. And in order to find a way that works better, they need to stop doing membrane things. They need to stop these membrane practices. So I think that's probably what's going on and what's contributing to what looks from, to an archeologist like an overreaction. It's people adjusting to their environment and their perception of what's happening in a way that works out for them. So we're still exploring the causes of a lot of these changes, but we do know that farmers in the Southwest moved a lot. So Scott and I have both talked about cases where people moved and it's important not to see that movement as uh, anything, as people failing to adapt. It is evidence that people are adapting. Moving is how they adapt sometimes. So in the membrane's case, what people were doing wasn't working for them socially and moving was probably how they fixed it. So the people that I was speaking about, the people archeologists call membrane, uh, those people moved and we know that farmers from that area moved all around the Southwest. And today their descendants are living in places like Zuni and Acoma and other pueblos, some probably in Northern Mexico as well. All over the Southwest, the descendants of these people are still farming. They're just not farming quite in that exact same place. And when the Spanish arrived in the 1500s, the people who were living in that place were the Warm Springs Apache. So people moved a lot in the Southwest at a long time scale, uh, but they stayed in the region and their descendants are still here but people move their homes and they change different aspects of their societies. And climate change today is leading to a lot of the kinds of conditions that archeologists see linked to movement and to big social changes that happened in the past. And Scott's gonna talk a little bit more about how we see uh, that playing out in the present. As I said at the beginning of our talk, um, we would think about others that could benefit from these archeological insights from the past. The Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change is the world's source of consensus data and interpretations on the challenges that anthropogenic warming provokes and the pathways ahead. They say progress towards resilient and sustainable development in the context of changing climate extremes can benefit from questioning assumptions and paradigms. We did not set out to do this, but our results have forced us to question common sense assumptions about climate related migration in the past. As many archaeologists have said, the past is an archive of the results of past human decisions in the face of many challenges and opportunities. This archive is a record of what worked, what didn't, and sometimes why it didn't. Models predict, and the evidence is showing, that the Southwest is getting hotter and drier and more urban. These are problems archeologists of the Southwest have seen before. Responding to these challenges, we would argue, is not the work of specific disciplines or political actors. It is a shared human responsibility. What specifically though can archeologists do? We'll confine our answer to this question to the results presented tonight and hope to stimulate others to make similar connections where they work anywhere in the world. We think our results are important for policymakers and analysts around the world planning for drought and increasing climate related migration. First, for drought planners, every US state and many communities and nations around the world are working to identify where and who will be most harmed by anthropogenic warming. And especially they're working to identify those vulnerable to the problems caused by increasing climate streams such as drought that are predicted as the earth warms. 
We're not suggesting that the past predicts the future, and we acknowledge that the past is not the same as the present. However, we do think that the past can help us gain insights into current problems and ask questions that will help us make better policy decisions. We think the next step with our results is to use modern agricultural production statistics, climate data, and migration data to see if the more water, more migration results we found hold in the present. Farming communities across the US are under increasing stress from lowering water supplies and highly variable and declining precipitation. We also know that communities with modern water conservation practices that include restrictions on use are essentially buffering strategies like those used in the past that affect people's perceptions of water scarcity and perceptions likely played a role in people's decisions to stay or go in the past. We'd like to ask what is the relationship between the extent of conservation and restrictive practices and decisions to migrate? If the past is like the present, we would expect that places with the greatest extent of conservation and restrictive practices would experience the least migration, perhaps due to the expectations of water shortfalls or declines not present in places without normalized water restrictions. Beyond the US, there are 1.5 billion people living in smallholder households, and they provide up to 80% of the food supply in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Smallholder farmers in other arid to semi-arid lands practice agriculture in ways that are not dissimilar to those in the Southwest Northwest. If the relationships we found in the past hold in the present, then efforts to identify vulnerable people and places are improved. Common sense expectations cannot be assumed, but must be tested as we have done and the results matter. Second, our talk is about migration and the factors affecting people's decisions to stay in a place or move. Migration is an ancient human strategy to solve all kinds of problems and to seek new opportunities. Drought related migration is forced when people can no longer meet their food needs or think that they can't and want to avoid starvation. This is one of the primary concerns about anthropogenic global warming that millions of people will be forced to migrate because they can't meet their food needs during these times of drought. This is already happening in many places around the world. Like drought planners, migration specialists and policymakers can also benefit from questioning their assumptions of why people decide to move or remain in place. Drought is certainly not the only reason people move, as we and many others have found in the Southwest. We hope that archaeologists around the world consider deepening their understanding of the many causes of migration, including climate extremes. If archaeologists are able to work with those addressing climate-related migration and other causes of forced migration in partnership with drought planners, migration specialists, and others focused on the problems of the present and future, archaeologists can also deepen our understanding of the past and the histories we are working to reveal and interpret. We think our research also has implications that are for everyone. Uh, for us, we're living through times of change, just like some of the times that Scott and I have talked about uh, in the past. And in the big picture, we see humans succeed. We see humans change what they're doing, live in a different way and uh, survive these events and thrive after them and be successful in the long term. Uh, but that's really in the long term. And um, when you're living in these moments of big change, it's actually, it's difficult. People make hard decisions. People do things that they don't wanna do, like leave their homes, change important aspects of their lives, important parts of the social structure that dictates how they do things. People make big changes that are difficult for them. And these are probably things that they didn't want to do and felt like they had to. No one wants to be one of the generations that lives through these times of really dramatic change, but we don't get to choose. Uh, we live when we live and things change around us, but we do get to choose what we do about it. So we think that the past can inform the future. It doesn't tell us what to do because the past is different from now, but it helps us see what we have done and understanding better what we have done can give us a better chance of making good decisions and can help us decide what we're going to do now with the situations that we're faced with. We have a lot more work to do to understand climate influences on human behavior, and that work really matters. Uh, again, this is part of the reason for science. Things don't always turn out the way that we expected them to turn out, and that's why it's important to study them and keep learning about them because we keep 
coming up with unexpected uh, new insights into how people react to different situations, what the possibilities are, what the answers are that seem to work out in the long term. Um, so people who study these things, not just archaeologists, but in all different fields, and the people who support that research are doing something important by helping us to understand the world better. So to all of you who support research and science and understanding the past and the present in all different ways, thank you for making work like this possible and helping us learn about the past and the present and how to make the best decisions we can with what we're given. So thank you very much. Very interesting. And yep, of course, we have some questions rolling in. So let me throw in um, a first one and see what you guys think. Um, the, the, the viewer asks, Scott talked about being able to use human experiences in the past, being able to tell us what strategies worked and what didn't. Were the Mimbris and Central Arizona cases examples of adaptations that worked or didn't work? How can you tell the difference? Did I start with a hard one? <laughs> uh, well, well, it's not an easy one. Okay, well, you know. <laughs> you know, f f at the level of homo sapiens and humans, the <laughs> strategies worked, right? The descendants of those people persist and, and that is success by, mm -hmm. you know, by any, you know, by any measure. So persistence is, mm -hmm. is, is success. Um, you know, I don't know. I almost don't know. Cut. I, I don't almost don't want to classify those things as successes or failures, right? Archaeologists are limited in, in, in you know, sort of knowing the minds uh, of past people. We can we can observe their actions quite well, but um, from my standpoint personally, I think of it as amazing adaptation over time, millennia, tens of thousands or ten thousand years at least. Mm -hmm. Karen, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I think that um, sometimes things that feel like a failure when you're living in the moment uh, can seem like a success later. And it really depends on your perspective and the scale that you're looking at. So um, maybe things felt like a failure to somebody who was living in 1125 and had to move out of their village and move to a different place and change a lot of things that they didn't want to change. But it was also a success because that person's descendants are farming in the Pueblos today. And there were probably good things that happened to that person later that they hadn't anticipated. So uh, sometimes things that feel like a failure can also succeed. And the fact that people continue to farm here for centuries and centuries after the events that we're talking about, those are successes. Mm -hmm. And I think Karen said this, just a, another quick point. As non-Indigenous archeologists listening to Indigenous people, movement is a way of life in the Southwest. It has always been a way of life, they tell us. So, you know, I don't think it was being considered a failure necessarily, you know, from that perspective, you know, they wouldn't be who they are without movement. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. There's been a lot, there's sort of a lot of questions sort of related to um, migration and my, Population movement and population decline. Um, I was going to ask this one specific one, um, which says, how do you think population density factors in? Is it a major factor in better watered areas like higher population density with resultant social relationships? But yeah, see what you think about that. Yes. So there yeah. Karen, if you don't mind, I did look at that and you probably did too, but um, there are a lot of other variables we need to look at just where people, mm -hmm. other than just where people are living, right? And one of the things I looked at was the demography going on and mm -hmm. asking questions like, were people living in large settlements more likely to move during drought than people living in small settlements? And the results showed that there was no difference in the frequency of movement based on the size of the settlement which was in and of itself really interesting and not what we predict. However, uh, I did find a relationship um, between the density of the watersheds that people were living in. So it wasn't the settlement that mattered, it was the number of people in the watershed. And those areas that were most dense had the most movement, regardless of the sort of water productivity that different people had. So density matters, it probably affected people's you know, capacity 
uh, to you know to travel further to to hunt or 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 whatever. So I think there's definitely density effects that we didn't have time to go into. Mm -hmm. Karen, did you have any things about that you looked at? Yeah, I mean that that explains it really well. I think uh, another thing that density can impact is uh, the movement choices that you have open to you. So if you're living in a landscape that already has people all over it, um, movement becomes a lot harder. And we can see different cases in the Southwest where it was probably easier and harder to move around uh, depending on what else was going on at the time and what kinds of social connections that you had and things like that. So um, yes, population density affects all kinds of things and the kinds of movement related strategies that we talked about tonight are very much impacted by those too. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. Um, so more talking here about population and stuff, that's a topic after all. Um, population graphics show decreasing settlements over time. And you mentioned that the migration of the, of the indigenous peoples was within that, in that. Is there, is there a contradiction going on there? Where did these people go if the settlements are, do you understand what I'm asking? I think I get the question is that if the, Settlements are, there's less settlements. Where did all those people go? Or do we have some population decline going on as well as movement? Yes. So yeah. those, what's being referred to are those uh, six maps and, and the <laughs> decline. So the dots are not showing that some settlements are getting bigger. And that's certainly the case, okay. particularly along the Rio Grande in okay. New Mexico. Some places there are definitely getting bigger and there are a number of strong arguments that um, sizable population from the Northern Southwest uh, did move to settlements along the Rio Grande. So we definitely have migration going on there, but there's also population loss um, throughout the Southwest. The estimates uh, based on the Coalescent Communities Database, not my work specifically, but the work of Brett Hill and others at Archaeology Southwest and elsewhere shows that up to about 50% population loss. Now, some of those folks could have, you know, moved into Northwest Mexico or beyond. Some of those, some folks, and there's probably more people in the Southwest than we know just from the settlement data. Some people have less archaeological visibility um, during that period, but I think there's consensus in most among most Southwestern archeologists that there was absolutely population loss as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. And Karen, did that happen in the Members Valley as well? Was there population decline as well? Or was it people just moving? What, do you have a, a, a sense? In the Members Valley, there was a lot of population decline and we have trouble figuring out where those people went because again, they changed the things that they made that allow us to recognize them. So a lot of the people in the Membrace Valley did seem to move away and we're not sure quite where they moved to because they uh, probably started to look materially in terms of where archeologists can see like the people who lived in those places. In the Eastern Membrace, it declined a little bit but not very much. So again, that's one of the really striking things in the wet Membrace Valley population declined a lot. In the dry Eastern Membrace, it only declined a little. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Oh, I just saw a comment here, just FYI. You have an IPCC author in the current assessment round who has found this to be very useful. So just FYI, guys. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> we hope to be useful, so that's good. Another question here. We got a little bit more time if you guys are not exhausted yet. Um, she says, this is an awesome and timely presentation. Our populations are so much larger today. How much do you think that those that remained in place that you know, didn't migrate back then succeeded in surviving due to the declined local population? And how might that translate to today? Thoughts? I don't know if you want to take that. I need to hear it again. <laughs> oh, I think I made it. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Let me find it again. Let me find it again. Yeah. So. How much do you think that those that remained in place succeeded in surviving due to the decline to local population? Like, I mean, was it, it sounds like it was helpful for those that were made, that were, that were left because all everybody else disappeared or went away. 
Uh, in know. some ways it probably was helpful and in some ways it was probably very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, the way that Scott and I both came into this thinking, which is about uh, sort of economics and getting enough food and things like that. I mean, if you have fewer people trying to use the best farmland, it seems like it'd be easier if you stayed in a place. But when these changes occurred, a lot of people's social situation changed also. When you are used to living with people and depending on them for different things and having these relationships with them, and then you can't see those people anymore, that changes a lot of things in a negative way. And that's yeah. another parallel that I can kind of draw with COVID is that we were used to seeing each other in all of these really informal ways all the time. And I think once we stopped being able to see each other face to face a lot, and we stopped especially having casual interactions, a lot of us started to realize how much we missed those things and how much those things gave us that had gone away. And that when I think about the people who stayed in the Membrace Valley in the past, when almost everybody moved away, but not everyone, like their social worlds shrank so much and all these connections that they depended on and taken for granted shrank so much. Uh, and that's hopefully temporarily what's just happened to us and our world's gonna be different after this, just like their world was different. So in some ways, everybody moving away was probably good, but in a lot of ways, everybody moving away from the people who were left was also very, very hard for them, I would think. Hmm. And it's not just less people, you know, if we think about it, it's, it's certain people have roles in, in communities, either healers and storytellers and uh, teachers. And of course, we all have many roles, but at some point, you know, we think communities probably reached a threshold where it was easier to go than to stay. Mm -hmm. That we see, you know, that this is not just a sort of a linear, you know, to use my term, thermostat relationship. And we can see this in other areas with different data and more detailed data, but we think there's a threshold. And I say we meaning to sort of archaeologists that when communities start to lose too many people, everyone else just decides to go. Mm -hmm. They may not have had to go but it's just better for them to go because you know some of their family members or, or relations are leaving and other people they rely on. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. There have been some questions about how do you, um, let's see, how do you pin <coughs> about other factors that could be leading people to being to moving beyond just drought or something, for example, like, you know, pestil pestilence, you know, sickness, conflict, invasions, um, problems like that. How do you sort of, is, is, that, is there a way you can parse out those kinds of causal factors in people's movements or do we, are we just recognizing that there's a lot of factors that probably come into play? There, yeah, in, in short, yes, there are a lot of factors. And if, if the person asking the question is thinking about those population decline maps that I showed, Certainly no one thinks or is necessarily persuaded, uh, no one meaning sort of Southwestern archeologists that are, you know, we're breathing our own knowledge creation here, that it was, that it was drought. Um, but I would also say that none of us think that drought was insignificant right. either. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are ways that we can look at more than one factor and other studies and other archeologists and anthropologists have looked at multiple factors, but you know, as often in case in science, you've got to, like really break something down in, into a simple couple of variables so you can really look closely at it, recognizing that it's never one thing. It's always many things, but you're just trying to see how that one thing, you know, moves the dial. Yeah, yeah. Karen? You know, is there evidence of increased competition and violence during times of drought? Do you know if there's evidence of that? In the memories case, people have actually looked for that and not seen it. Mm. Uh, we see fairly subtle things that suggest sometimes there's social tension, like um, some of the images on pottery and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but older excavations where people did bioarchaeology, they're not showing differences in trauma and sickness and warfare and the evidence of those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so as far as we can tell, that's not happening, at least not as, at a big enough scale for us to pick up on it uh, in that particular case. I mean, there were a lot of times when people moved and changed in the Southwest and um, each one of them is a little bit different in some ways, but in the memories case, at least we really don't see evidence of, of sickness and violence and really bad health. Uh, that's part of the reason that I was expecting to find something fairly subtle. Um, and 
and didn't obviously, but, uh, but yeah, we don't really see evidence of disaster is what I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. The Membrace case was not a disaster. It's a case where um, there was a drought and people moved and we're trying to understand what contributed to that, but it wasn't a case of like epic bad. <laughs> epic bad, I like that, <laughs> epic bad. <laughs> Oh, let's see. We have any more? We got a minute or two left. Um, we have one person was asking, um, are there quantitative data that demonstrate that migration or movement was more common or more important in the Southwest than compared to perhaps other regions on the earth? Do you have any sense? So uh, there's also a comment about someone recognizing that, yeah, migration just seems to be a fact of life, but... Um, it, it, do people move around everywhere, all over the world? I guess they do. <laughs> they do, and even more so in 2021 plus, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's as I said, it's our strategy, our homo sapien right. strategy. Uh, it's a great thing, you know. Unfortunately, uh, in the modern world, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of things that makes migration more difficult for people to move away from bad situations. So um, mm -hmm. in, in terms of looking to the past, I would... I would absolutely expect there's comparable data in other regions of the world that we could, you know, compare notes. You know, arid and semi-arid areas, people people move. That's that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, I'll just share this comment too. It's a just someone just wanted to make a comment. She's saying that she's impressed that this sort of analysis that you both did depends on massive amounts of data collected and archived over generations of archaeological field work. And it implies consistency, validity, and access. So um, um, people are um, responding and remarking on your abilities to manage and you know, manipulate these levels of data now to come to some of these kinds of interesting, interesting conclusions. Well, well Karen's probably too uh, humble to do this because she works for Archaeology Southwest. <laughs> but I can tell you that without the Coalescent Communities Database, I would not have had a dissertation and I would not have a research trajectory. Right. Um, you know, to, to have access to, you know, the, the greatest compilation of settlement data, you know, in, in, in a region like this, I mean, it, it's, 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 it holds so many future insights. We have, or I have just barely scratched the surface of it. And that source now is, is even better than when I use it and it's, it's more accessible and, I'm sure Bill could talk more about the archaeology <laughs> southwest database here, or Karen, but I, I think it's just an extraordinary thing, and I don't know any other region that has th these kinds of data, and a good portion of it are publicly accessible, with the locations sort of hidden. But a lot of the things I talked about can absolutely be observed through the database publicly. Yeah, we are really lucky to have this, and that database keeps expanding, and it's turning into um, a, the Cyber Southwest project, really, uh, mm -hmm. and. <laughs> Things are being added to it. Um, there's been a lot of work so that you can look at pottery in more detail now, since that's how we figured out the times and places of a lot of these things. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to add other kinds of data in there too. So it is really important to, to use the data that people have collected in the past and to keep it in a place where everyone can find it and where like you can still open it on a modern computer and things like that. So it's been really good to, to watch that um, that database keep expanding. And, and I would say to the Archaeology Southwest volunteers who have been out with Desert or Archaeology Southwest, uh, you know, sort of project leaders and walked and, and recorded sites on surveys systematically in so many places in Southern Arizona. And I expect there's plenty of people in the Zoom room have, who have done that. Th that is absolutely essential. The Coalescent Communities Database and many of those settlements that, that I referred to uh, in my own Central Arizona case study, many of those were recorded by volunteers, wow. not necessarily Archaeology Southwest, yeah. but volunteers yeah. with the Museum of Northern Arizona and elsewhere, and 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 over you know seventy five plus years probably. So survey data matters. It's the archive of our human experience, and you know we appreciate folks like her, like her on this Zoom call who have made their time and resources to, you know available to document our shared human past. Yeah, no, that's so very true. Yeah, it's it's so exciting to see the, you know, yeah, we've been collecting this data for, 
you know, 75, 100 years, like you said, with the, with the belief that it was going to be important and useful, and it is, and we, you know, are still using it today, which is really great. We should probably wrap up. I'm going to ask Bill to come back, and Karen, you can stop sh screen sharing. Um, thank you guys so much, and let Bill thank you as well, but that was a fantastic um, presentation, and it, um, Bill, you might want to say more about this, but it's interesting. We ended up on the site, the, the databases and stuff, because our next our cafe next month will go into more detail about Cyber Southwest database itself. So, Bill, do you have? Absolutely. No, the, thank you, Scott. Um, and definitely the last commentator there that uh, talked about massive databases, that's the frame of reference for uh, what we're gonna be looking at in, in next week's, next month's uh, archeology span cafe. And Scott, yes, dealt with an early generation of this compilation of data and it has been growing. Uh, we're gonna be, continue to um, put this database together to make it more accessible, to focus on even finer grained abilities to look at maybe households uh, and be able to ask new and, and uh, different questions that will help get at some of the kinds of decisions that people have to make when they're choosing to, to leave a place or stay in a place. So um, oftentimes that happens at the uh, family level or the kin group level or the community level. And uh, Cyber Southwest is gonna be a tool for um, taking on even more complicated questions. So Josh Watts, uh, another Arizona State University PhD um, and a preservation archeologist here at, at Archeology Southwest. Um, his title, uh, just what is Cyber Southwest? The potential of massive databases for future preservation archeology span research. So massive databases. <laughs> so, um, so stay on the edge of your seat for the rest of the uh, <clears throat> month uh, and join us on March, no, April something, whatever the first Tuesday in, in uh, April is. And thanks everyone, uh, Karen and, and Scott, thanks for a great presentation. And thanks a lot. Linda performed superbly tonight, thank you. <laughs> thanks a lot, we'll see you guys in a month. Okay. Uh